That's over. So here we are all gathered together and we have um, Tom Barnett here with us along with um, Dirk from South Africa and Zed Stephen from the lovely Queensland and I'm actually here in Bali right now. So I um, forgot to tell you that too, Tom, but never mind. <laughs> so um, I'm enjoying the lovely rain coming down. So um, welcome everybody and welcome to everybody who's listening. Um, so how shall we start this off? Shall we begin with the the uh, talking about common law, Tom, and um, begin with what we're talking about in regards to the beginners, you know, people coming into common law, how do they get a, a sense of understanding it right from the beginning without just wanting to know how to um, create paperwork and stuff like that? You know, there's this couple of different parts of it. A lot of people get caught up in how do I get out of a fine and, and how do I write notices and stuff? But can we get how they can actually come into it completely in knowing what is common law? Why is it important for us? And why is it important for us to understand it with what's going on in the world right now? Okay. Well, to start with, I don't want to confuse anyone, but I don't really deal with common law at all. I deal with commerce and equity. Uh, common law is is simply uh, case law. It's like it's what happens when there's um, cases already decided in high court decisions, and they help to determine other matters. So it's based on previous cases. Uh, I think it's important to uh, realize that the world we live in is governed by commerce, and in commerce, the highest form of or the highest remedy we have is equity. So there's a Supreme Court Act in every Commonwealth state and country. Uh, which states that in any case where there's a discrepancy or controversy between the rules of the common law and the rules of equity, then equity prevails. So equity is simply what is fair, what is equitable and what is just. It makes a lot of sense just from a common sense point of view. And it was brought about because the, the common man on the street was not getting enough remedy through common law because it costs money to run a, uh, you know, a case with a, with a jury of 12 and everything like that. And if there wasn't already a predetermined matter or case with a decision, then it was hard for the small man on the street to get a remedy. So the remedies were brought about by equity. So to answer your question though, the, the first step I think for most people is to realize that absolutely everything, whether it's fines, taxes, uh, getting a vaccination, getting anything, is that people are going after a name. So what we have to realize is the very first step of the process is to distance ourselves and learn how to distance ourselves from the name. So there's the name, which is the entity. It's a legal entity. And that entity is not living. So if you're alive and watching this and listening to it, you already know that just by default, you are a living being. So the name is not a living thing, but you are a living thing. You're a man or a woman. So the what happens the way the system uses that is they get you to engage in what's called joinder and joinder is when you join to the name. So everything that they're trying to get out of the name, either extract from it or do to the name, they can now do to the living being because you unwittingly perhaps have joined to the name. So therefore now everything that they were trying to extract from or do to the name, they're doing to the living being prior to that, they can't do that because a living being, a man or a woman has rights and those rights can't be taken away. So I think that's the, that's the fundamental premise to everything that you'll want to talk about is that we need to learn not to join to the name. Okay, so that's that's something I've been getting into a lot lately, um, watching the straw man videos and some of the stuff that sort of comes out about when we were born and how to distract yourself from that. So it sort of really makes sense. But um, there are processes and everything that distract yourself from that dead fictitious name, so to speak. Um, what would be the, the, what are the main ones that can help you do that? So it takes you into your living name and living like, you know, the live birth certificate when you were born before, before they gave you the um, dead one. What's, what's the best way of going about that? Okay, well, you can always access your source document or your certificate of live birth, which is what you're referring to. That's got from births, deaths and marriages. Now, if you, for some reason, can't access it or you're born in another country or whatever the case may be, you can still do that by way of an affidavit. So first of all, contact births, deaths and marriages and ask for your source document. If they ask what that is, you say, well, it's the document that gives rise to the birth certificate. They will know what it is, but some of them are playing silly buggers now that a lot more people are asking for these documents. 
So you just need to stand your ground. So before I go any further, this is the most important part is what's called holding your position. And so when somebody just comes across this kind of information, they want it all now. They say, well, I didn't know I was being duped for my whole life. And now I want the remedies today. But the reality is it doesn't matter who you are. It's going to take you a long time to implement this, to understand it and to walk the walk. It's not just a matter of learning a few concepts. It's not going to get you out of any trouble. You're better off continuing to pay fines, continuing to do this and that until you actually have what it takes to stand your ground. Now, that doesn't mean not attempting to discharge. By all means, do that. But just don't expect that you're going to be able to do everything off the bat because the most important part is holding position. So what does that mean? That means you know that you can get a source document because you've just found out what it is. But if somebody on the other end of the line starts to test you and you don't know who you are and what your rights are, then you're going to fail. And you're going to fail because you don't really know who you are yet. You know of who you are, but you don't know who you are. And that's fine. You've got to be okay with where you are. You know, you're not going to pick up a guitar today if you've never picked up a guitar and then go and play to 100,000 people on a stage because you'll get booed off stage and maybe kicked in the head on the way out. So you need to learn this stuff right. And wherever you are starting from now, that's fine. If you're 50 years old and you're just finding out about this and it's going to take you till you're 55 before you can really use it, well, then that's fine. That's just how it is. So when you call or contact births, deaths and marriages, you're just asking for your source document. I don't know what they're doing now. They might be starting to ask, why do you want that? I don't know what that is, whatever they're doing. I'm not saying they're going to do that. It's just that with a lot of processes, now that more and more people are learning about it, what you could get instant access to before, you're not getting instant access to today. Going in to get an all rights reserved driver's license today takes a bit more work than it took even six months ago because pre corona hoax no not many people knew about that or needed to know about that now more people do know about it and need to know so now transport officers are saying well we can't do that or why would you do that and they're testing people you can still get it like you can still get anything but they're making a bit harder so i just need to stress that point that if you're just new to this well congratulations and it's a it's a very worthwhile path to take but please do keep in mind that what used to work 10 years ago when somebody says to you yeah you just send in a notice and it takes care of everything well 10 years ago that might have been true but today it's not now you need to go through the full process and back it up at the end which is different from what you used to have to do because there's just more people doing it so just quickly before you go to the next bit there um i actually rang the um hospital where i was born and they ended up um, giving me um uh, FOI form, Freedom of Information, where I can request my documents. Would mm-hmm. that be easier than the birth, deaths and marriages? Yeah, you could do that for sure. Yeah. Yep. Okay. There's a lot of ways. This is the other thing. Is there's a lot of ways to get anyone documents. So it's also why I don't usually like, I mean, we can go through anything you want today, but I don't see a lot of value in going through specific processes of how to do something because then people only learn that. And then yeah. something goes not quite right with that or out of the ordinary and then they don't know what they're doing so it's much more important to learn all the fundamental basics of what is a name what is joined up what is commerce what are the rules of commerce and equity and from there you can create you can literally create your own process you know there's probably 10 or 50 different ways you can obtain a life birth certificate one of the other ways is actually to do it by way of affidavit so if you were born in another country and you can't access births deaths and marriages for whatever reason you can uh, go through an affidavit process to claim that you are a living being. And if it's not rebutted, then that becomes a fact. So there's different ways to do these things, but the simplest way is just to go FOI or uh, birth, deaths and marriages for sure. Yeah. I have seen the affidavit um, one as well. So um, I think I was just going to do both of them and be done with it. Yeah. um, Yeah, you could. Uh, I would just, it's sometimes it's best to uh, not try to rush, you know, you just don't throw everything out and hope something comes back. Like really go into do the best you can with one process before you write it off and do another. I would, um, I'm the only reason I'm bringing this up is because of what could happen in somebody might see this recording in three months, you know, and yeah. for some reason it's harder then, but as of yesterday, I, I had somebody get their live birth certificate without a problem. So it's not, I'm not saying it's going to be a problem, just that keep in mind, you might need to start getting more creative in the future. Beautiful. 
So and what's the process then after that? I like how you said before, how you want to describe it. And I'm happy to go with that because, you know, we're all learning um, some more advanced than others. And there's always questions in people's head of the beginning and then the, the process following on. Okay. So uh, uh, for which, what do you want to go into? Um, or whatever comes after affidavits. I think you just said before, you'd, you'd rather just go into the fundamentals of what to do rather than go in depth with it. All oh, right, yeah. So, um, well, that's basically it. Beyond that, it's, um, so I guess the premise behind all this is that uh, a living being, men and women are born with inherent rights and those rights can't be taken away. You can give them away inadvertently, but they can't be taken. You can only give them away by your consent which means you agree to it or your assent, which means an unconscious decision to, to agree. So that means if somebody offers to take those away and you remain silent, then you acquiesce, which means that you just give in to that by default by your silence. So the reason this is important is that a certificate of live birth is a document that says that you are a living being. So why do you need that? Well, it, it asserts or it, um, it backs up any claim that you are a man or a woman because only a man or a woman can be alive. The entity, the name is a dead thing. So that live certificate of live birth gives rise to the birth certificate, which is what's used to create the trust for the entity. So why is that important? Well, at any stage without a document, you can always assert your, your status as a living being. And you do that by using what's called a second witness principle. So everything that we do in commerce comes from biblical principles. And the Bible states that the truth cannot be spoken out of the, or the truth can only, sorry, be spoken out of the mouths of two or more people. If you're not two or more people, you can't tell the truth. So if you go saying to somebody, I'm a living being, I'm a man, I'm a woman, you're not telling the truth because you're one person and you can't tell the truth. So you need to use what's called a second witness. So that means using somebody else. So then I would say to an authority figure or somebody that's acting as an authority figure because there aren't any authority figures, I would say, uh, do we have agreement that I'm a man? And a lot of the time they'll just say, yeah, why? What does that have to do anything? But they've given the agreement. So I say, well, don't worry about what it has to do is I say, great, that's great. Thanks. We have agreement then that I'm a man or they'll say, um, what does that have to do with anything? And I'll say, well, that's not the answer to my question. That's a yes or no answer. So for the second time, do we have agreement that I'm a man? If they don't answer it within three times of asking, I can answer it for them. And then I'm telling the truth because they have assented, unconsciously agreed because they have refused to answer or remain silent. That's their agreement. So that's another biblical principle is that the rules of three, you have to ask or notice something three times for it to become, for an agreement to be formed or to be deemed as truth or fact. So we can use that in day-to-day -day life. If we're faced with a police officer or a customs or a border officer or anybody, then we can then say to them, hey, look, do we have an agreement? They'll say, well, you need your pass for this or you need that or you can't go here. Okay, that's all right. Look, before we go any further, do we have agreement that I'm a man? Well, what are you talking about? Well, no, that's a simple, that's actually a simple answer. It's a yes or no. For the second time, do we have agreement that I'm a man? Well, I'm not having this conversation by the side of the road or wherever you are. So, well, look, you don't have to at all. But for the third and final time, do we have an agreement that I'm a man? It's a simple question. It's yes or no. Now, at that stage, they might go, yeah, okay, then. Or they'll, they'll keep going and say, well, look, I've, I've asked you three times, so I'm answering for you. We have agreement that I'm a man. Okay. So now it's solidified in the world of commerce that I'm a man. And a man, remember, is a living being. So by default, I don't even need that certificate of live birth because it's now deemed in commerce that I am a man and a man is a living being. So now I have rights. A living being has rights and a slave or an entity only can have benefits and privileges. So rights are greater than benefits and privileges. So how does this all tie together? Well, when we're dealing with commerce or just the world in general, it's set up in a fictitious way where we have a private realm, which is the realm of substance. That's what we're born into. But then there's also a mirror image of that, which is called the public realm. And the public realm is what we're signed into. And we're unconsciously, we unconsciously agree to throughout our lives. So this is when you start looking into the straw man and maritime law and everything else. This is where we're, we're a vessel that's birthed and docked. And then there's a certificate made in a name and we're lost at sea and we're all this and that. You can learn all that if you like, but it just comes down to the two realms. There's public and private. 
the public is what where when you're asking these questions you're really asking how do we navigate the world of the public and, and maneuver into the world of the private that's what you're really asking because in the world of the private that's where living beings reside and that's where rights are intact the world of the public is that world of entities of dead things of fictitious entities and that is the world of only benefits and privileges and if you don't quite use your words right or know who you are you will subvert yourself to, in Australia, the 7 million plus statutes, codes, legislations, uh, acts, all those things. Whereas in the world of the private, there are only two laws which are essentially condensed down to love thy neighbor and love thy creator. Or in other words, do no harm and cause no loss. So those are the, that, that's natural law. And there's actually case law that states that man is not bound by man-made laws without his consent. That's Cruden versus Neil, 1796. So even though that's an old case law and it's a United States case law, that's still used throughout the world and still stands today. So it essentially means that man is governed by natural law, but not by man-made law, unless he consents to it. So then why are we still paying fines and taxes and told we have to get vaccinations and all that, told how we can, can't cross a border or have to wear a mask, otherwise we face penalties? Well, that's because we are coming under statutory rule or statutory legislation, acts and codes. And we do that because we're not asserting ourselves as the living being. We are operating as a person. Now, going back to the Bible, the Bible states in, there's probably over a hundred points of a Bible that states that the, the God or the creator is no respecter of persons. And that's because a person is a fictitious legal entity. And that's what the system uses against us. If you look at any code act or statute, it always refers to persons. At no point does it ever state that it refers to a living being, which is a man or a woman. So we can use that as our remedy as well. For example, if uh, somebody's saying, or if I'm at a border and I say, somebody's saying I can't cross and they say, and well, I say to them, well, hang on, you're saying I can't cross this border. And they say, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. You need a permit or you have to go here or there or you simply just can't cross. So then I'll say, well, look, do we have agreement that I'm a man? So I'll go through that process and they'll do that whole thing. Remember, they'll either agree or they'll just try to move you away from the question. And that's where holding your position comes in, which I'll get back to in a minute. But we get agreement that I'm a man. And then I'll say, look, so what's your source of authority? If you're telling me that I can't do something, then you're assuming authority over me. You're acting as a source of authority. Now, that's fine if you have that. I just need to know that you have that. Where's your proof of claim? So they're making a claim. You can't cross. That's a claim. Or I'm not letting you cross. That's also a claim. Okay, so now I'm saying, well, that's fine. You just need to provide proof of claim. So what is your source of authority to stop me crossing a border? So then they'll say it's the, I don't know, Biosecurities Act or it's the this, that and the other act. Every single time it'll be an act. And then I'll say, okay, right. So you're quoting an act, yeah? And they'll say, yeah. I say, well, how does that act apply to a man? And they'll say, what do you mean? I say, well, look, that's not actually what I asked. I asked how it applied to a man. But anyway, if you want to get into it, I say, well, look, I've read through hundreds of act acts and they all apply to persons i can't find a single one that applies to a man so can you tell me how your act applies to me they can't answer that question if they do try to answer that they'll be incriminating themselves under their own under their own uh legislations that they're operating under they'll incriminate themselves so going back to holding position this is the important part see anybody can learn that what i just said that takes three minutes maybe to repeat that to yourself and wrote, learn it. Okay. But that's not going to be your remedy. And why won't that help you? Well, you're only memorizing some lines. You don't understand the principles behind the lines. That's really important. And that's where holding your position comes in because more and more often you will not be given direct answers and it won't go to script. Nothing ever goes to script, right? Which is why it's not an important, it's not a wise move to learn scripts in this world. So we need to understand the premise. The premise being that in the world of commerce, there are only two sides. There's a creditor and a debtor. You can't be any, anything other than a creditor or a debtor. So a creditor 
asks questions and a debtor answers questions. That's why police are trained in a way to get you to always answer their questions. Judges will not answer a question if you ask them. That's because they all understand commerce and they know not to answer questions. But because we're operating commerce, we cannot, we can do that as well. We only assume the role of the debtor. They offer it and we accept because we answer questions. But we can always do two things. We can say, I don't answer questions. Or we can, an uh, uh, we can answer questions with questions or simply ask questions of our own. So when I say to somebody, do we have an agreement that I'm a man? And then they say, oh, that's got nothing to do with this or anything like that. Or they try to move it away. Why would I ask? Why would I answer that? I don't have to answer that question. Anything that they'll say, they're trying to move it away from the question that I've asked. Now, I'm assumed the role of a creditor in the beginning. Now, if I'm not really a creditor, they'll move me away from that and I'll fall into the role of a debtor straight away if I start answering their questions. But if I know who I am, just by nature of my being, I know who I am, I won't fall into that role as a debtor. So no matter what they say, if they're trying to move me away from it, I'll say to them, no, 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 that's not the answer to my question. I asked you a simple yes or no question. So I'll ask for a second time, do we have agreement that I'm a man? So then they might divert it again and I'll say, no, no, I don't care what they say back. I'll say anything other than yes or no is not my answer. If they say no, well, now they have to pr provide proof of claim. Say, really? You're saying I'm not a man. Where's your evidence? Okay, so it always comes back to me remaining in the role of a creditor and asking the questions. I direct and control the conversation. They don't, they don't. They can try. But that's, you know, you just have to listen to a judge. Go and sit in a courtroom, for example, and, and just listen to the way they deal with people. They won't answer questions. They'll only direct because they have to remain in the role of a creditor. So this is the most important part is, as I said, it's not really learning process. It's learning the rules and, and learning who you are. And it's okay if you're actually not in the state yet of being a creditor. Being a creditor is almost being like a master I know, like a black belt in uh, jujitsu or something. It's like you inherently know that and can use it at any time. You don't have to think about it. You're not going to get taken out of that role. No matter who, you know, tries to attack you, it doesn't matter. It's just, you know how to deflect it. And that's what being a creditor is. It's not something you pick up in a day. It's something that you practice. So that means role playing in your own mind in front of a mirror and getting some friends or doing Zoom calls and, and getting people to, First of all, go along with what you're saying. So you can just get a feel for what am I doing? I'm a creditor, I'm asking questions. What kind of questions am I asking? What do I want to be uh, you know, ascertained as truth here? And just go through those, then get people to start throwing curveballs in and not answering the questions the way you want. So you have to learn how to hold position and to continue to stay on your path. You do not let people take you away from your path. You stay on your line of questioning, which if you want later in the call, we could do some role play as an example, if you like, and just kind of have a feel for how that works. But um, yeah, so that's really where we're at. We're, we're at the stage of uh, holding position and continuing to ask questions as a creditor and establishing your uh, status as a living being and a living being uh, can be done through way of see it's a bit it's a bit cumbersome to have to carry around paperwork in your pocket you know like here's my live certificate of birth because sometimes people don't even know what that is you show that to a police officer and they might not care they go what's that give me a license or i'll arrest you but here's my certificate of live birth you know if you don't know how to use it it's like it's not going to do anything it's a certificate does nothing you put it on a table it does nothing you still have to back that up because you'll still get um, you'll still get tested on it. Uh, How do you back that up? Like, you know, if, if they are asking for, because I've I've watched quite a few different um, aspects around what you're talking about, where people mm -hmm. were sort of saying that and how the police responded to it. And sometimes they just, especially if the black robo cops that, you know, um, Victorian police has brought in, they yeah. don't care what you say, they're on a mission mm -hmm. and that's it. If you can say you're God and they'll still, you know, throw you in the yeah. back of the divvy bag. So what's, what, what is your ID to be able to say, this is who I am and this is my proof that I'm a living man or woman? All right. Um, first, part of that, first part of that is to you don't make any claims. As soon as you make a claim, you're in hot water. 
because now you have to back it up. And if you can't back it up, you're going to get you're going to get pulled, you know, dragged across the coals. So do not make claims ever. A creditor does not make claims. A creditor uh, uses other people to back up claims for them and or makes others provide proof of claim. It's called setting up your adversary. So at, under no circumstances ever should you ever make a claim that you are a man, a woman, you're living, you don't come under any jurisdiction, that uh, any, don't make a claim. Don't, don't tell them that they don't have authority over you either because you're making a claim. All they have to do is turn around and say, oh, well, do you have some evidence for that? Where's your proof of claim? You don't have any, you can't provide it. It doesn't matter what paperwork you have or what you say from then on, you can't provide proof of that claim. Now, you can, which I'm going to get into, that's the next part of this, but the first step in learning this is to stop making claims. If you make a claim, you can incriminate yourself. Okay, do not make claims. That's the number one rule. Uh, how does that work in reality? Well, if, let's say a police officer pulls you over and you say, what do you want? And they say, well, you were doing 80 in a 60 zone, right? Now, it doesn't matter what they've got. If they've got a radar gun, if they've got a photograph, if they've got whatever, they don't have any evidence. What they're looking for is you to incriminate yourself. You incriminate yourself by agreeing, arguing, saying, oh, can you just let me off this time? Anything you do pretty much uh, incriminates you. So what you would do in that situation is that if they say you were doing 80 in a 60 zone, you could say, do you have some evidence for that? But then they'll try to show you their radar gun and you say, no, I didn't ask for that. I asked for evidence. If you don't know how to hold a position well, you might not get around that. The best thing you can say is, well, look, I highly doubt that. Is there anything else I can help you with? If you say, I highly doubt that, what are you saying? Are you saying yes or no? Neither. You're not, You're not making a claim. You're saying, I highly doubt that. So you are not making a claim and you are dispersing whatever they were trying to give to you. They're trying to get you to incriminate yourself and you're just saying, look, I highly doubt that. Thanks very much. Is there anything else I can help you with? Now, you're not being their second witness. You're not incriminating yourself. And more importantly, you're not making claims. So you were doing 80 in a 60 zone. No, I wasn't. Well, now you're making a claim. You've just incriminated yourself. Okay. So words such as, I highly doubt that, or it's my understanding that now you're not making a claim. You know, if you say, oh, I'm a living being, you're making a claim. If you say, it's my understanding that I'm a man, are you making a claim? That's not a claim, right? So you're not, you haven't given a definitive statement. So these are little, uh, you know, these are little things that are really important for people to internalize is to not make claims, not answer questions, to divert things, to, to answer questions with questions and make them a non-committal uh, answer, you know? Uh, as far as how do you have, can you have proof? Well, you can, but I'll tell you, I haven't gone through the process yet because it's long and... It's long. <laughs> That's basically what it is. So how do you have proof that you are a living being? Is there a get out of jail free kind of ID that you can carry around that says that? Well, yes, there are. I'll give you three different ways that I know of that are technically uh, sound. One is the crown. Now, when you are, well, the crown is essentially the oldest, um, jurisdiction you could call it. I don't think jurisdiction is the right word, but that's the oldest. Crown meaning it's just, it comes under natural law. It comes under cause no, cause no harm or loss, the crowning, the birthing, all that sort of stuff, the beginning of mankind. So if you look through any act, or it'll say there'll always be a remedy. It's like the Police Powers Responsibility Act or the Traffic Act or the Biosecurities Act, whatever it is. There'll always be an element in it. If you go and get one of those acts from the internet and then you do a word search in it and you put crown in there, it'll show everywhere that crown appears in that act. And there will always be a section that says this act binds the crown. Now, if you are the crown, then anybody acting for the crown is essentially an administrator, but you are the crown. It's you, then you don't come under that. That's a very simplistic way to put it, but and that won't get you out of anything at all. But what that means is that prior to the source document, there's actually a, a document that comes prior to that. And that document doesn't have a name on it. So the crown, if you want to take the crown route, it's called no name crown. Because as soon as there's a legal entity or a fictitious entity, you are somewhat embroiled in that system. The crown has no name. 
So you can go through a series of documentation that brings you back to the crown and then you would have to come under, you still have to come under like um, an agreement and that would come under tribal or um, indigenous uh, title or rule or law, law, L-O-R-E or uh, something to that effect. That is a way that you can go about it. The other way is to do your PPSR or your UCC filing, which is where you essentially come back from uh, you essentially can appoint yourself as um, a power of attorney for the name. So you as a living being can be power of attorney for you. So me, Tom Barnett, can become power of attorney for Tom Barnett. That sounds a bit weird. How does that work? Well, it's because the name that they are using is the fictional entity, the all caps uh, entity. And me as a living being is now uh, becoming power of attorney for those documents. And then I can trademark and, and um, uh, copyright my name so nobody can use it without my permission. If they do, then they can be held liable for that. Uh, those, are, those are some of the ways you, you can essentially get yourself a document or an ID. However, pulling that off is another thing altogether. You really, for example, if you've sent in any notices, you need to rescind those notices. That's why I haven't gone through that process yet. Why? Because you actually have become an enemy of the state by asking for any form of currency as a monetary uh, compensation uh, by addressing to the wrong, uh, the wrong entities. Because I'll, I'll put it this way. Uh, anybody who is uh, acting in a source of authority, police, government, uh, banking, anything like that, if we keep writing to them to ask for something or to say, I don't want to, we're, they're only acting in that source of authority and we are actually propagating that by sending our notices into these bodies because we're, we're going through them. But the real side of it has always come under na like the, the native law, the native title, the indigenous, uh, and more than that to the creator, but we don't write our notices to them. So we've actually continued to propagate the fictional power that these authorities have by actually writing our notices to them. So if we want to get completely out of that system and carry around an ID that says that we are sovereign or whatever you want to call that or sovereign, mm -hmm. then we would need to rescind all of that stuff because otherwise we are still embroiled in that system to some degree. So um, your question really was, what do you use for ID? Well, if you are providing a, a document to, to get identification, I would be using a source document, something that says that you are a living being. I would definitely be using that, not a birth certificate, not a driver's license, not a passport, because those are all in the names of the entity and those are all in the public jurisdiction, not the private. So then you ask, well, well, how do you operate? Can't you just operate in the private, not the public? And you, you can. But my, where I've got to with this currently is that I'm going to go through those processes. I am going to, uh, you know, go through removing myself from their clutches to reclaim my trust. I'm going to do that. It's a long-term process. In the meantime, though, what I've been able to do is to fend off uh, potential pirates because of just understanding some of the basic rules of commerce and not relying on identifications, but simply having these interactions one at a time, whether it's a police officer uh, on the street or if it's uh, somebody on the phone to me or if it's an, an email or a written uh, you know, notice of demand or something like that, I'm just handling things in commerce and the majority of them are going away. Some just continue to roll over, but at the same time, you know, no money's coming out of my account and I'm not getting taken off to jail or anything like that. So uh, I really feel that it's important to have a long game. If that's what you want to do, if you want to actually reclaim possession of your trust as the trustee and uh, um, you know you own it, because at the moment we don't own it, then you can do that. But but have that as a long game. And in the meantime, uh, you know, get really familiar with your rules of commerce and uh, and you know how to navigate the world of commerce because it is there's only some really simple basics you need to know, and I think that that can get you out of a lot of trouble in most cases. Um, and the other aspect of that is just you know not asking for not not trying to engage in it so you can test it so much, but just use it when it's necessary. Same as martial arts kind of analogy. Like you really only want to use that when necessary, not going out trying to, um, you know, 
however people might do that. So where would you like to go from there? Because there's probably a lot I've covered that we could easily expand on, but what do you want to cover now? I, I just want to ask you a question, uh, Tom, if, if yeah. you know, will allow me. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the one thing that um, I see a lot of people struggle with is um, uh, seeing the hierarchy of all these laws. And I mean, you're probably going to uh, confuse a lot of our uh, members saying that um, you operate under uh, the law of equity and uh, staying under uh, commerce and, and uh, everything that you've explained now is, is mostly under commerce. But people fail to see where this all fits in and that, uh, I mean, they, they want to, to know who's the, what, what law is the highest law uh, uh, that they can fall under and everybody's uh, caught on to common law. Now, uh, people don't really understand uh, uh, common law, but uh, and me, me neither, not not to to that degree, but uh, I just want to know if you have done research to see where this all fits uh, uh, together, and it seems like you, you have, but you, you've kind of stuck to uh, um, the law of equity to, to do contracts, and that's under uh, uh, Mark Petelik. I mean, I, I'm also on his forum. Uh, would you say that uh, um, that's the way to go? Is it the easiest route, or yeah. would you... Do you think uh, people should should start on this journey, journey of common law and, and also focus on, on the law of equity? It depends what you mean by common law, though. Like, how do you define... I mean, if you're just talking about straw men and all that, that all comes under commerce as well, because that's what's traded. So common law, like I said, it's literally just case law. So guys like Mark, I mean, equity isn't Mark's thing. He just found out about it because... The way he found out about it was by taking a common law approach to everything. And for about 10 years, he was having huge success with it. And then all of a sudden, they were getting no successes. Nothing was working. And it was only from a guy from New Zealand that clued him on. They said, you got to look into equity. And then since looking into equity, all the results have come back. So it's because, again, it's because when too many people find out about something, sometimes the goalposts change. And it's not that the goalposts change so much because you might be doing everything right. Common law stands, but does the corrupt system allow it through? So a lot of times you've got justices that work in courtrooms, for example, that just won't, won't let something through and uh, they'll just turn their back on it. And that's an injustice, but that's the system that we live in. It's highly corrupt. You're never going to make it all the way through to the end. Like from, from where all this stuff comes from, for, through all the Freemasonry and all the, everything else that it's cloaked in and, and protected by, as, uh, as somebody like us that's in like normal land, you're never going to get near it. Nowhere near it. You won't even get past the justice. You might get past the justice in small cases, but beyond a justice, there's like, that's the tip of an iceberg. You've got all these other um, entities and shell corporations and all these other things that, it, that hide and cloak and protect the ones that make this system. And you just know, I think it's really important for people to realize you're never going to get near them. So that's why it's important, I think, really just to focus on some of the fundamental basics. And really, it comes down to a few key elements, which I'll, I'll um, just, you know, bring up more if you feel that there's more. But first one is taxes. Second is debt. And third are fines and rates and those sorts of things. I think they're the main things that really stop people from being able to attain a level of comfortability or um, security in the world where they're actually okay, where the amount of work they're doing is not being offset, where they're actually still behind no matter how much work they do or whatever. I think those are some of the main things that we're dealing with. So then really the answer is how do I, um, how do I take control over those elements of life without trying to go, what's the highest law or what's the this and that? Because really the highest law is simply the the creator, you know, the highest law is cause no harm or loss, but navigating yourself and standing in that, that um, standing in that status is something else. And it's confusing. It's, it's not as simple as just, it's not as simple as some people make it sound. And so I think it's important just to try to handle, uh, I'm going to give you an example to try to put this into a, illustrate this in a second, but um I think that's really what we're trying to do is to give ourselves the best chance of living our best life. Now we came into this world and this system was already in place. I really don't think we're going to change it. I think it is so ingrained and there's so many asleep people that keep it functioning the way it is 
that um, that we're, we're not going to really change it in our lifetime. I don't think I would love to see that. And it's highly possible, but it comes down to, it comes down to like the old style of how it would be done, which is we get the ministers who are in power in our local uh, governments and things. And we literally chase them out of town with pitchforks and spades. That's how it'll happen. But it's, it's, there's too many people that just aren't there yet. Yeah. So yeah, so, uh, but I, that, and I don't take that as a negative thing because I've still had a lot of success in just using the basics of commerce. And I, I mean, I, I don't want to confuse things too much because common law and commerce and equity are kind of all the same things. It's just that when you're trying to get to the end result, which is the remedy, the remedy doesn't come through common law, it comes through equity. But I think what you mean by common law is the things like the name, the entity, uh, you know, some of the, the rules of the game that still all comes under common law. Absolutely. But it's just the higher jurisdiction is equity. That's all it means. So if you can't get a, a remedy in common law, you might be able to get it in equity because it's a higher jurisdiction. That's all that that means. And so uh, the illustration I was going to give is taxes. Now I don't make, I haven't made money, much money since I was about 22 and I'm 40. Like uh, most teenagers have more money than I do. And so therefore I haven't paid tax in a long time because I actually haven't earned enough money to pay tax. Now tax in Australia, especially is one of the most illegitimate claims of right that anybody's ever made because even their own charter says that the tax was supposed to be put in during the world wars and then removed after, but they just kept it in. Their own charter also says that the Australian taxation or the income taxation system is a voluntary compliance system it means we don't have to participate in it unless we want to their own charter says that so why are so many people <laughs> embroiled in tax well here's the thing here's the thing about that you can definitely um i don't want to use the word fight because i don't like the i don't like thinking of things in terms of fighting the system because if you're doing that you're giving it power if you fight something you're giving it power you also it's a negative energy you're feeding it and i don't think that's the way to go so what when I, I only brought that up because that's the way most people think so when it's taxes, that's an injustice, that's wrong, it's criminal and it's unlawful. So on principle, you might say, well, I'm going to not pay tax. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to either um, reclaim my status or I'm going to write notices or I'm going to um, pay it with a promissory note or a bill of exchange. And then when they don't accept that, I'm going to hold my position. And a number of different ways you can go about that. All are legitimate and all will work, but all require energy. So the question that I, I would like to pose to people is how much energy do you want to or are you willing to invest in holding your position as opposed to just paying a fine, paying some taxes and doing whatever and being okay with that? Now, there's not a right or wrong answer either way. I'm of the position of I don't like that system and I hold my position, but it's, it's not wrong to go the other way. So the example that I'm going to give is if I, for some reason, started making a lot of money, like let's say I started making $200,000 a year. And out of that, the government probably asked for 50 to $80,000 in tax. Okay. Now, bearing in mind that money is a fictional, it's fictional. It's not real. It's based on arbitrary values. Like if the work that I do now, I do a lot of work now and I get paid almost no money or a lawyer who does less work than me uh, gets paid uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Why? They're actually giving less value because they're misleading people. So why, you know, money is arbitrary. What we earn is not representative of how valuable we are or the amount of work that we're um, outputting or anything. It's not representing anything like that. And it's all fictional to begin with. It's all, bought, it's all made up through securitization of signatures. So keeping all that in mind, if we just consider like currency, the word currency is actually comes from two words, current and C. It's got to do with currents and it's got to do with sea and maritime and all that so if we just consider it as that we use money rather than we have money then it flows in and it flows out so if two hundred thousand units of currency flow into me and then eighty thousand units flow out but by doing so i've still got plenty to grow some food in my garden to go for a surf at the beach to make love to my partner you know if I'm doing that, why do I want that extra 80,000? What part of me is holding on to? No, that's mine. I earned it. But did I really earn it? Like, what did I really do? Like, did I earn that in some slave that made the clothes that I'm wearing? Where's their 80,000? How did I earn that? You know, 
So when we can reframe some of the, um, the way we operate in our system, I might say, oh yeah, you want to check for 80,000 units? Here you go, have it. Because now they're off my back and I can continue. I've still got plenty to do the things that I want to do with my life without being greedy and wanting more than I need. Now, the only reason I brought that up is just an example, because I know that, you know, if you're on $600 a week and you get a $600 speeding fine, you're like, well, you know, that's like, that's pulling it. you going, well, you can't do that. You don't have a $600 check to write because if you write it, you're not eating, you know, the tax example I gave is different. Yeah. So then there's remedies all the way through. And I'll just give you some now because I think people are jumping straight into, I'll write my notices and I'll, I'll discharge it. But here's some other ways you can handle that. Number one, you can let it go to state debt recovery. Every state now has state debt recovery departments. It's like Revenue New South Wales, Fines Victoria, State Penalties Enforcement Registry in Queensland. And what they do is they take on the debt and they try to enforce it and they'll cancel your driver's license if you don't pay it and things like that. So what you can do is they can give what's called a work and development order. Let's say you're on Centrelink or something and you're, you don't have enough money to pay, but you clearly have a lot of time. You can go and do a work and development order. Here in um, our town, we can go to the, the local community gardens and they pay the equivalent of $30 an hour to pay off that debt. It's not a debt, it's a liability. So you can discharge that liability that way. Now, a lot of people in, in like low level jobs aren't making $30 an hour. Like I came out of only recently uh, doing contract work. I was making $25 an hour as a 39 year old, you know? And so when I had a fine, um, I only went twice because I wasn't really paying it off. I just wanted to do it to show people how to do it. I was working, working off the fine for more money than I would have made in my job to pay off the fine because they pay $30 an hour equivalent to do work in the community gardens at the community gardens. You got your hands in the soil. You're meeting other really nice people. You're doing something productive and constructive. It's a win-win and the fine goes away. You can pay that off the equivalent of $25 a week for the next 10 years. So wow. go ahead. I said, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. How that, how that sort of yeah, yeah. And a lot of people don't know that these remedies are there. So it doesn't always have to come down to the heavy hitting. I'll discharge this with notices or a promissory note or something like that. So I would recommend a lot of the time I recommend going side by side because that sometimes the path of least resistance is the best path to take. And so doing your work and development order is good. Or if you've also got the time to take, you can elect to have it heard in a court. You could go into a courtroom. You don't even have to worry about not answering to the name. You can join to the name. You can answer to your name. You can put yourself in their jurisdiction because I've done this before as well. And then you can just state your case. You can say, look, your honor, I believe I'm a good man. I believe I didn't do anything wrong. But I tell you what, I've currently been making $300 a week for the last few years. I actually have no money. Like, I don't think you have, I don't think any, you know, well, you, I won't, sorry, I won't put words in anyone's mouth. I won't go down that road. But what I said is, look, look, I'd love to pay. I just don't have enough money to pay. But what I'm happy to do is this, or if you feel the need to give me some, some uh, fine or whatever, can you please just keep in mind my circumstances? I'm sure you're a good man or woman. I'm sure, you know, you might have family or whatever in, in uh, hard circumstances before. Can you please just keep that in mind? And I'll be happy to do whatever you feel I should do right? You're giving them all the power, absolutely all of it. But I went in with two and a half thousand dollars worth of fines and walked out with $250 worth of fines, which I didn't even pay. I went and did two hours at the community gardens and then it went away. Do you know what I mean? I've seen people get their, I've seen people get $10,000 of debt or fines reduced to zero because the judge decided they didn't have to pay it. And they didn't do anything right in terms of common law equity or holding position or anything. Uh, are you Mr. Tom Barnett? Yes, I am your honor. Boom, you're in their jurisdiction, but they did it anyway. Uh, you know, you're, fine, you're charged with this, this, and this, and this. You've let them read out the charges into the court record. Now you're coming under that. You don't actually, if you do the common law equity thing, you don't let them read out the charges. You let them do that. And then they say, what do you have to say for yourself? You've pled guilty. What do you have to say for yourself? Well, Your Honor, you know, uh, I believe that it was all a mistake. I believe that, uh, you know, whatever it was that happened. You know, in my case, I'll just give it a, an example. This was before I knew how to do this sort of stuff, right? My driver's license got canceled because I hadn't paid a uh, fine for not voting for like three years when I was 18, 19, 20. Now, I didn't even know that I had those fines because I'd changed addresses and blah, blah, blah. 
Oh, sorry, sorry. I was 23, 24, 25. That was after I'd got really, really sick and lost my health. Now, what had happened is the reason I didn't vote was that I was out of state going to a clinic and I, was in, I had severe chronic fatigue. Now, I got a letter from the doctor saying uh, the condition that I was in, that I was out of state. Now, the, the voting, uh, whoever does that, that side of things says, well, we don't accept that. And I'm like, what? I've got a doctor's certificate and I was out of state. How are you? And so the fine went to state debt and all that. I thought it had gone away, but it didn't. I went to renew my driver's license one time and they said, oh, you can't. You've got a, a state penalties debt. And I said, for what? And then I looked it up and then it had gone up 10 times the amount because it was like years old. And, um, and yeah, so anyway, then I like, I'm like, well, I'm not paying that. That's criminal. And so then I got pulled over two and a half, three years later for driving unregistered and unlicensed because I'd printed my own driver's license and printed my own license plates, written a notice to the state transport department telling what I was doing. Didn't get a reply. So I assumed that they accepted it, but I didn't even give them three notices. I sent them one. I spelled affidavit wrong. I did everything wrong. But what happened was I went to court and I said, I had $3,000 worth of fines, unregistered, unlicensed, uh, displaying a false plate, uh, uninsured. I think that was all of them, $3,000 worth or two and, a half, two, two and a half plus extra fees. So anyway, point being, I just said, look, your honor, this is what happened. I was sick. I had a note. They didn't, I thought, how is it my responsibility to, to check all this? And then I just went off on this story and then she just let me off all of it and gave me, I think it was 200, I think it was actually $150 plus court costs of $100 to make it 250. And that was knowing nothing. That was spelling affidavit wrong, not putting in the number of notices that are needed, um, joining to my name, letting her read out all of the, uh, the, the charges, nothing right. And I still got let off. It was hilarious. And then I didn't pay it because I did a work and development order and it didn't even do all the hours and it went away. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. No, I, think, so, I think that's another thing that uh, people struggle with is um, they, they're they afraid of doing all of this stuff. I mean, when I started on my journey, I, I remember how daunting it was sending the first letter for yeah. the uh, non, non-consensual vaccines. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to get. And Mark also explained it in that first interview that you had with him is people are afraid to apply new knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it's, it's something that um, I also want our listeners to get, get past is just getting past this fear of, of some, th this major thing is going to happen and then I'm going to sit in jail for the next 15 years or so. Yeah. Yeah. That won't happen. It's um, so just going back a step, what I recommend people do is take the path of least resistance while still, so I was using that time to learn about common law and equity and commerce, right? So I was kind of taking two roads. One is I was just towing that line with the path of least resistance while learning about, you know, so a year later, the same thing happens. I can discharge that. As far as the fear and things like that, I think a lot of it's unfounded. I think it comes from movies and TV shows and then hearing stories about this guy who knows this guy went to jail for the rest of his life, but it's probably not the full story. He might've murdered someone. And then it sounds like he went to jail for like writing a notice, you know, we don't really know these things. And uh, if you, the more you deal with things, like what I'll say is there's no, there's no easy or short answer for that. It's just to do it. And one of the ways you could, you could help yourself in your own mind to do that is to do like the deathbed exercise where you're imagining yourself in 40 or 50 years. And then that self is talking to you now that you're about to pass. And it's like, are you going to let me sit in my shell and not come out of it? You know, or, you know, are you going to go the rest of your life not living that? Or, or am I going to, are you going to let yourself do that? You know, and a lot of the times that's kind of thing will help you to, you know, get going on something or not hesitate or to actually step out and face some of your fear and do it anyway. That's really, that's really that simple. It's just, just saying, well, what's going to happen if I don't do it? And am I okay with that? And that's not a wrong answer, actually, by the way, if somebody asks themselves that question, they say, you know what, if I go through my whole life, just bending over for the system, I, I'm okay with that. Well, then you're not wrong. But if you, but as long as you're not lying to yourself, if you say to yourself, no, I'm not okay with that. I want to start standing up for who I am and living why I was put here on this earth. Then if you say, then if you start going and just abiding by the system, then you kind of lie to yourself. And at some point you won't allow yourself to do that. It'll get too uncomfortable. So really it's just a matter of doing it and you can start slow. You can, you can start easy. 
writing a notice, nothing's going to happen. I'll tell you, I've written before I really knew how to write notices. I wrote some horrendous ones. Most of the times they just get ignored, but what will never ever happen is that that will be used against you. It just won't. So don't be afraid to, to start writing notices, get them wrong. That's okay. You will get them wrong more than likely to start with. Uh, don't be afraid to ask police questions. What I would suggest doing is I learned a lot of this because I've gone most of my life without a driver's license. So I've had to learn it, but what could be a really good, uh, a good exercise to do is if you have a driver's license, there's nothing wrong. Your car's registered. There's nothing that they can get you for, for example, is to actually talk to police or if they pull you over or you go through a random breath test, let them know that you're going to do it, but ask them a few questions first. Hey, look, aren't these illegal? Isn't there a high court case that determines that randomly stopping somebody is not legal? Don't you need cause? You know, like ask the questions when you're in a situation where there's nothing that can go wrong. Look, do you have a license or not? Like, yeah, no, I do. Sorry, like, I didn't mean to upset you. I just, I just, you know, I'm just learning about um, my rights and things at the moment. And I really want to know. And I hope you don't make any false claims because I'd hate for you to um, be pulled up and investigated because you, you told me a lie. I don't want you to, I don't want, you know, you don't want to lie to me today, do you, sir? <laughs> you know, be, you can be a bit cheeky with them. But, um, and then you can go, well, look, here's my license officer. You know, then let them look you up. There's nothing wrong. You're not drinking. You're not on drugs, you know. So what you've done is you've managed to drive off no, no harm is caused to you, but you've had the experience of uh, dealing with a police officer where there's nothing to lose. It's a bit different when you roll through one of those things without a license, like I've done several times. Sometimes it goes my way and other times it didn't. But that's, do you know what I mean? So you can, you can often, uh, or let's say you're in a place in the world where you have to wear masks, you could be walking up to a place of business or something with a mask on, and then you could take it down. And you could be saying, and then you could have the conversation and you can do it when you're not having to really hold your position to the highest degree because you've walked somewhere without a mask. Okay. So it's really just a way of easing yourself into things. And then you can be doing the, the higher level of not providing ID, not wearing a mask, doing these things, but not refusing. So the difference is if you refuse to show a police officer ID, you are in default and you are you can be uh, penalized. If you refuse to wear a mask, you can be penalized under statutory rule if you don't know how to speak your way through that. So what's the difference? The difference is coming from the highest place of power, which is as a creditor. So rather than refusing, you can conditionally accept or you just make them be the one that provides proofs of claim. So where's your ID? Well, hang on, we'll get to that. Okay, so now I haven't said yes or no. We'll get to that, all right? So now I'm saying, uh, I, you know, well, let's say it's a police officer. I'll say, we'll get to that. Uh, first of all, who are you? I just want to see a driver's license. No, no, I heard you and we'll get to that, okay? But who are you? You're asking me for identification. You must have some source of authority. Are you a police officer or something like that? You know, I don't just assume that because you have a car and a bat and, a, and an outfit on, you could have got from like, you know, an adult store. You know, what, what, why do I assume you're a police officer? Are you a police officer? Yes, I am. Do you have some evidence for that? Show me your identification. I don't have to do that. Well, are you sure about that? Because at the moment you're personating a police officer. That's a federal offense. If what you are not like showing in the identification. Sometimes people say, are you under oath or something? You can ask that as well. You can ask any question. Any, that's, I'm glad you brought that up because you can ask anything. Are you under oath? Are you, uh, you know, who do you serve? Uh, do you represent the Commonwealth? Do you serve Her Majesty the Queen? Whatever it is, you can ask any question because what will happen is if they don't answer it, you can answer it for them. Or if they tell a lie, you can, you can, um, you can pull them up on it. Uh, or you can invoke the office of a Commonwealth public official if you feel threatened or that they're lying. But basically they need to provide identification and a business card as part of their uniform. If they can't provide that, they're personating a police officer. Now that's a federal offense. They can lose their job for that. So this is all come about from them asking me for ID. Now I haven't refused. Remember, remember how that went from the start. Oh yeah. Look, we'll get to that. First of all, who are you? I want to know who you are. Are you somebody who's assuming a, a, a place of authority over me? Now prove that you are prove it. Where's your proof of claim? Are you refusing? Well, look, that's a federal offense. Now that can go several ways from there, but I'm just pointing out 
that I'm not refusing, okay? I am saying, we'll get to that. First of all, show me your source of authority. I go into a place of business that wants me to wear a mask. Oh, look, that's fine. I'm not going to refuse. This is just going to say, hey, look, um, what's your source of authority to ask me to wear a mask? I'm not saying I won't. I just need to know that you have a source of authority to ask me to do that because if you don't and you're assuming false authority or making false claims, I might have to sue you for that. I don't want to have to do that because I'm not a bad person, but I just want to know what we're dealing with here. So I've not, remember at no stage have I refused. Uh, really quickly, under commerce, there's four ways you can, you can uh, essentially deal or answer a question. Two are honorable and two are dishonorable in commerce. The two honorable ways are to fully accept. So you've got to put a mask on. Oh, okay. And you put a mask on. So where's your ID? Oh, here it is. That's a full acceptance of the offer. The second way that's honorable is a conditional acceptance. So where's your ID? So put a mask on. Sure, look, we can get to that. First of all, I'll do that on the condition that you can show me that A, there's a reason, there's cause, there has to be cause, and B, you can provide your proof of authority to ask me to do that. If you can provide those two things, I'm more than happy to do that. I'll give you my idea, my ID, or I'll wear a mask or I'll pay a fine or whatever, okay? The, tech, the two ways that are dishonorable is one is to argue and be belligerent. I'm not doing that, refusing. That's dishonorable in commerce or remaining silent. So where's your ID? You know, I don't have to do anything. Cross your arms, keep your mouth shut. That's dishonorable in commerce. So again, I know we're going through a lot. This is going to be a lot for anyone to take in the first time they hear it, if that's the case. But, um, but that's what we're dealing with. And it's why it's really important to not refuse to do anything because so many people are doing that. And so many people say that. They write to me, how do I refuse the vaccine? You don't refuse the vaccine. That's the answer. You can't refuse. It's dishonorable. It's a weird system the way it works, but hey, that's the system we're in. You can hate it as much as you want, but that's not going to change it. So, you know, you've got to learn some of these rules. Now that you touched on the vaccine and, and there is, and I'm not sure, can't remember exactly where it is now, whether it was the constitution or a referendum that they brought in where the, the government got the people to accept um, uh, giving them family payments and stuff like that. But they made two distinctions that at no stage was medical interference or dental interference to be given um, to anybody. So they can't actually force the vaccine on you legally, but they can obviously use other means to do it. So how would, everyone's talking about a couple of things here, vaccines and how to get out of them, and also how to stop the government taking your children, which I just remembered as well. So with the vaccine yep. and those laws, what is advice you could give to somebody in regards to, one, not to be so scared about it because there's so much crap going on out there about vaccines, I don't read them anymore, but you know how to stand up and say no and not lose their job or whatever the yeah. case might be. Yeah, so conditional acceptance is the best form for that because that's when you're saying, yeah, look, um, you want me, just to backtrack one step so people have a frame of reference, everything in commerce comes under offer and acceptance. So okay. everything that's that's put out into the public, you know, there's going to be vaccines, tra uh, travel will be restricted. We want to put in 5G. We want to do this. We want to do that. They're all offers. And an offer is like any other offer or from a basic point of view. I say to you, hey, I want to come in and I want to paint your walls. I think they look good in blue, right? I want to do that. And that'll cost you $800. That's an offer because you can always say, no, I'm happy with my walls the way they are. Thanks very much. And I want you to paint my walls. Or you could say, Actually, they could be done in blue, but I don't want to pay 800. I'm happy to pay 400. How does that sound? Now we're negotiating, right? Or conditionally accepting or whatever. But at no stage can I just walk in and paint your walls. And certainly I can't just walk in and paint your wall and say, now you owe me 800 bucks because there was no consent on your part. I made an offer and you either accept or you don't accept or you conditionally accept. Okay. So that basic premise is used in all forms of commerce. You need to get a vaccine or we'll take your job. You need to get a vaccine or you can't travel. This, that, and the other. Or we'll take your kids, okay? They're all offers. The reason that you should not get upset, angry, or defensive about it is because it's exactly the same as me saying, I'm going to come in and paint your wall and you're going to give me $800. You have no fear or anger about that because you know that you can turn around and say, no, that's my wall. I do not consent to that, okay? And it's the same principle with all this stuff that's being offered because it is still under commerce, all offers. The reason that some of these things actually make their way in is because people unwittingly, because they're asleep, make it happen. How do they make it happen? Well, 
they'll say something like, hey, you can't travel now unless you get a vaccine. And then what do people do? They go, oh no, oh my God. Oh, we can't travel now if we get a, unless we get a vaccine. That's so horrible. Did you know we can't travel? Did you know we can't travel? And they just start speaking it around and propagating what was only an offer and now calling into reality uh, what was only an offer in the first place. Had they have said, hmm, going around to their, all their friends or sharing it on social media, hey, look, we're being given an offer that we can't travel without a vaccine. Let's see about that. Okay, they're making it a public notice. So actually, no, look, we don't consent to that. Or, hey, look, that's actually fine, but can you provide a source of authority to say that we can't travel? Do we not have rights to travel? Are you saying that we're persons? Are you saying that we're chattel? Are we wards of the state? Are you actually admitting that? You know, it's this is the way that we can bring that in. We can conditionally accept or non-consent. The other way is simply to just give a non-consent. It's like, hey, look, you guys can't, uh, you know, travel, we'll take your kids if you don't get them vaccinated. Really? Well, look, I don't consent to that. The same way you can say, no, I don't consent to you doing my walls and doing them blue. Okay. I know that sounds simplistic, but that is actually this, the analogy that is as, as clear as you can make it as far as what we're being given offers and acceptance. So your question is, how do we get out of it? First of all, I don't like the, the term get out of it because we're not in it in the first place. So the question really is, how do we not consent to that? Simply, we don't consent to it because by verbally or written notice or by getting together with enough people and putting in uh, a like a class action or something like that. So the simplest way really is to, first of all, you have to know who you are. So remember, everything comes from inside first. So the first thing we do is we get really clear within ourselves, not from a place of fear, but from a place of who we are. Not from a place of, you don't come near me or I'll kick you in the head. You know, that's a real, that's a real defensive fear-based place to come from. So you just go, no, no, I know who I am. I know what I am. No one's coming near me with the vaccine. I don't consent to that. It's calm, it's measured, and it's, it's strong. So first of all, is we get clear with ourselves on who we are and what we do and don't want. Then what we do is it comes a step out, and then we can send off some non-consent notices to the government or the health minister, i oh, sorry, like the prime minister, the health minister, your local MP, um, anything like that, where you can send in non-consent notices. Now, the other way to do it is to, um, you know, let's say, uh, or sorry, go back a step, non-consent or conditional acceptance or both, whatever, whatever you feel like doing. So with regards to the vaccines, I just want to set a bit more of a stage here. Now, with regards to kids, for example, one of the things I recommend people stop doing is referring to the young as children because child and children, those are statutory terms. If you refer to people in the statutory way, you put them under statutory rule. So refer to them as your young or that your young men and women. What um, about possessions? Pardon? What about possessions? When they talk about, you know, everything you own, your house, your kids as possessions and you can have uh, them in a house or... Well, they're actually your property. Property. property property, and possessions are two different things. So uh, everything that you own, that's your, your property. Like this, uh, my um, chair here is my property. My phone, yeah. that's my property. Um, and your young are also your property. That's really important. That's really key to know because nobody has, uh, nobody has rights over your property except for you, right? That's just how it works. Nobody can just come and take your computer or something. I mean, I know people, oh, that's a bad example because people are getting things possessed, but you can't even let them do that. But my guitar here, that's mine. I paid for it. I own it. No one can just come and take it. Otherwise, it's theft without my consent. So your young are your property. So that's why they can't come and take uh, your young away. Now, there's ways you can do that. One of the ways I first learned about this was from hearing Mark Patelic speak about when his brother, who doesn't know much about this sort of stuff, inadvertently got it right. Child services came to his door and they said, we're, we're coming for your kids. And he said, what? He said, are they yours? Are you claiming you own my kids? He's using some of the wrong words, but, they, but what he did inadvertently was he established the claim of right right there and they walked away because they knew that they didn't have a claim of right over him because they don't own him. They were his property. So until, you, until you're younger, 18, you technically own them as your property. So that's one of your remedies is to realize that they, you have ownership over, over your young. You can give away that ownership by referring to them as children, 
uh, joined her in their names to certain um, to certain things. But you can always get a, around that anyway with words and things oh, as well. Um, something important to do with that, that's why I've been playing a lot around in that area recently. Mm -hmm. When you're born and they create that fictitious um, birthing for you, you yep. actually become wards of the state. So if yep. you're wards of the state, the government has entitled to take you. So you're just saying, just by saying those words, that stops that. Or should there also be something else done in regards to making sure you put them as your property? Um, I've, I've talked about um, before yeah, well, to a public trust or something. Is that strong well, enough just to say those words or should you even go further? No, I wouldn't. Well, the, the deeper you go, I'll just answer it with an analogy first. You're better off knowing no martial arts than like 5% of martial arts because you know just enough to get yourself into trouble. Mm -hmm. You need to know a lot of it or you need to know none of it in most cases. And I think law is no different. I think you're better off knowing almost nothing because you, you start to learn too many things without learning the whole thing. You'll get yourself too far down the track where now you're actually raising alarm bells and you'll get into trouble that you can't get out of. I think it's um, I think that's that's one of the most important things is to not think that you're further ahead than you really are. And so um, I would just recommend using that, the fact that they're property, because you're not dealing with the state in that situation. You're dealing with an agent of the state. Now, an agent is liable personally if they do the wrong thing. And that's where you're using this. Are you claiming you, this man or woman that's come to my door, you're not the state, you're an agent for the state. Now, are you claiming you have rights over my young are they your property because if you're claiming that they're your property and you know they're not or you're making false claims you're in for one hell of a fight you know most and they're not going to take that so then what happens well then do they come back with three other officers and then 10 police officers you know is that what's going to happen next but even still let's i mean there's so many things that work in your favor here trespass they can't trust they can't come onto your property without your permission so that's trespass. You can get them to leave. Now, there's also a case law, uh, Dylan versus Plenty, which is where po a policeman came onto a guy's property and he wanted his daughter, who was 15, I think, at the time. And uh, he said, get out, get off my property. And the policeman said, no, I'm here for your daughter. He said, get off my property. And he said, get off my property three times. So he went around the back of the shed and got a plank of wood and belted the copper over the head. Got arrested for that because he assaulted the police officer, but in court because he hired a barrister, he won six hundred thousand dollars because the cop trespassed. And now Dylan versus Plenty is trespass case law. Nobody can enter your property without your consent. Um, that's something you can use to your advantage. You know, there's a lot of these things that that can work uh, to your. I don't want to say. I'm just stopping myself as I say things because I that even that phrase things that will work. It's assuming that it's, you know what I mean? That's, I don't like that turn of phrase. Anyway, you're going to ask something? Yeah, I was just going to say, and I'm probably doing that thing going down, but, you know, because there's a lot of conversations going on around this, there's a lot of people have the fear in regards to their kids. So and as you're learning, you're coming up with ideas. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the trespass notice, what if you had a trespass notice on your children at all times as well too? Is that something that would uh, yeah, work? Yeah, sure, yeah. Well, yeah, but you also need three of them. So when you have the no trespass sign at your house, you've got to have one at the entrance to the property, whether that be a gate or put up a sign at the entrance where the driveway meets the road or the path. Yeah. You've got to have one halfway to your residence and then one at the front of your residence. So the, there's three notices. Just putting one on your gate actually isn't enough because remember in the rules of commerce, we need to notice three times or ask three times. So that applies to notices as well. But at the same time, Remembering that these agents aren't very cluey. So remember the state isn't coming for your young uh, agent of the state is coming for them, for example. So if they see a no trespass sign, that might be enough, you know, or you can back that up with your words as well. There's a lot of things that I think it's good to be creative about this, the way you're doing. Um, I don't know if I can uh, also, a little um, bit of a um, Quickly just saying, sorry, um, Derek, I just wanted to ask also, because you touched on this a way back, um, and it's, it's been something that I've had in my head that a lot of people don't know, uh, and I've heard it before, you mentioned trademark and copyright. When you mentioned that, were you talking about trademark and copying your um, uh, living man and woman name or the dead fictitious one, so that then when they tried to use that, you've, uh, you've owned the copyright and trademark of it? Yeah, it's, well, it's both. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's so that they can use it. It's oh, sorry, it's, it's so that they can't use it against you. That's that's oh, the thing. Using it. Yeah, and also using it without your permission. So here's the thing, though. Like my name's Tom Barnett. There's probably I don't know how many of those there are in the world. At least a few. Or if your name's like Bob Smith, like how many of those are they going to be? So you can't you can't just trademark and copyright the name so no one else can ever have that name. But it can be done so that it's not used against you, and it's always tied to something else. Some identification number, date of birth, uh, whatever numbers on the birth certificate. So what you're doing is you're going back and reclaiming that side of things. I can't give you too much of how to do that because it's not, yeah. I haven't done it yet. Uh, I know of the processes, but I don't like talking about anything that I haven't done uh, because it, it's just too many people do that. And you're like, I did so many things that I'd heard about <laughs> and that people had never done. And geez, the, the, yeah, I made some mistakes because of that. I just had curiosity around it. That was also, I sort of wanted to get a little bit more clarity on it because yeah. at some stage down the track, I mean, I'm still learning and I'm still fairly new. I haven't done any processes yet. What I've done is I've been going, you know, to different places, listening to lots of different people. And I was going to ask you who's a good person to also listen to, but obviously you are uh, as well. Okay, well, there's a few different, um, like I say, there's different methods. I think they all revolve around essentially the same thing which is separating again the living being from the fictitious name and then going back and claiming to be uh, claiming right over the trust. Um, now, there's the crown method, there's the PPSR and the uh, UCC. Those are three main methods that people use. There's Gemstone University, which claims to uh, have success in the PPSR, uh, maybe other ways too. And then there's people, I don't, not sure if I can give any details on the crown stuff, but there's just look around. You'd find something, but yep. um, you yeah, find people. That, yeah, you'll find people that are like embroiled in that. Like the, that's their thing. So you can get the, the crown PPSR and UCC, but it does essentially just mean like separating yourself from the legal fiction. Is there the the part of it that you're doing? Cool. And one question just before Derek, I think he's, Derek's going to jump in. Um, Zed was saying before you did, you went to, I think I did a court case with Brian and Zev not long yeah. ago. Yeah. Yeah. Just going to check in with you. How did that go and what was that about? Um, so that was a common law court, the first one held in Australia. Uh, they haven't that? filed anything for, they haven't yet filed anything for, um, you know, to pursue it, to enforce it, to get an enforcement order. So the decision's been made, but the enforcement hasn't happened. And I'm not sure, that's what I was asking even when I was there, because I like to support these things, but I also like to play the reality card. And I'm like, well, we made this decision. That's all well and good, but who enforces it? Does this standard system that has, you know, officers that can enforce things do they recognize that decision and will they go and enforce that decision? And as yet, I'm not sure what the answer is to that. I don't know if it's a yes or a no, but it hasn't been done yet. So, yeah, I know. Um, I've done a couple of mock trial courts on Zoom and since then they've had a few more live ones. One just recently, I think Mark was at the last two as well, Mark Patelic. But um, the, I asked the same sort of question or we asked the question is once it's all been done at the court, it has to go to the uh, other law courts and that's supposedly they're supposed to actually make the, the yep. process go through. So yep. I don't know myself either to the answer. I just want yeah. to see if they was going yep. to say anything about that. Um, yeah, sorry, Dirk, I knew you had something to ask as well. I just wanted uh, Tom to speak around um, what I call sharing the fear because, I mean, that's actually something that you explain fairly well and I feel it's, uh, it's good repeating so uh, it can stop, uh, stick to the mind. And it's uh, all, all these ridiculous situations that they come up and they film. Like the, the latest one that I saw was a 78-year-old granny that got arrested. And one of the MPs was standing uh, uh, close by and he was like, this is ridiculous, this is ridiculous. And he walked into the parliament building and he spoke to that. And that was shared across the world. Like everybody thought that this is so insane. And, and look at where we're going with, with this draconian system. And uh, it was actually in my mind, and I don't know if you saw that, but it was completely staged. I thought that this is so ridiculous. Who would believe this? <laughs> it could be. I don't know the one you're talking about, but um, I know a lot of them are staged because you see the same people turn up in other videos. So they're like, they're part of, they're part of, uh, a, you know, you can tell that they're, act they're actors in that. As far as the fear goes, um, look, a lot of it is brought in because of images like that. 
and that's called propaganda. That's been used for a very long time. Propaganda to to um, engage in wars. Propaganda to make people think that there's a virus going around. Propaganda to make people hate people from other cultures. And it's all all under. It's all to feed this system that that feeds off of uh, fear, greed, uh, apathy, all the negative kind of emotions. It's what feeds it. So. I guess to answer your question of what to do about it, well, it's really, it really is a choice. First of all, is to disconnect from uh, that side of things. How is propaganda put out? You know, what measures and what mediums is propaganda, uh, does propaganda travel by? And some of that's a real conscious decision because a lot of people, even, even to the point that they don't really know, they're so, they're so into their phones, their computers, TVs, uh, reading newspapers and even who they listen to in in daily life it's really it's really ingrained quite deep so one is becoming really aware of what you're being exposed to every single day and making conscious decisions about what you allow to enter the temple of your you know your own mind the second part of that is what you actually do with it so if you are really well balanced it doesn't matter what you're exposed to propaganda wise or, or otherwise it won't have any effect because you still determine um, how you react to things because more more uh, specifically I should say you're not really reacting you're you're someone that acts you're very proactive so you're not really reacting to anything anymore so the fear is really a choice as I say some of it comes from a an understanding of a much higher perspective of your place in the world how you got here why you're here where you're going and all that sort of stuff that really helps the other thing is to realize that it's all just a play and a narrative and we get to choose the role that we play in it to a very large degree. And then uh, beyond that, you know, is transmuting it and transmuting something just means to change from one form to another. So what can you transmute fear into if it is fear that you feel, feel in the first place? So for me, I don't feel fear in the first place. That's, that's my first, um, that's not the first thing that comes up for me, but for other people that really is. But what you can do with that is transmute it into something else, transmute that into courage or transmute that into uh, an enlightening uh, perspective on something. It can always be transmuted into something else because it's not, you are not it. And if you're not the thing, if you can observe the thing that, that it is and you're not it, well, then it can have no power over you anymore. And so therefore you can change it into something else. So that's something that I think, you know, the more fearful people are, is generally a representation of where they are in the development of what we kind of broadly term waking up, like waking up to the deception, waking up to the structure of the world and waking up to uh, what we've been born into and what we're creating. That's, that's the deception. So the, I think waking up now, it might be a bit, bit of a, a shock <laughs> to kind of wake up in this point of uh, our development in, in uh, evolution, but you know, for a lot of us, this happened many years ago, but uh, now I think there's a lot of things being thrown at everyone at once, but that's okay too, because the thing is, is that everything happens at the right time and you're never given anything that you can't actually handle. The ego might not like it. It might have its sense of safety and security threatened, but that's only the ego that, that wants that. So realistically, that right there is the opportunity to move more from the state of the ego to the higher self. And that's a gift. You know, that could mean that all this stuff that you feel fear around of vaccines and 5G and, and the government this and the military that and the police that, that could be your path to actually finding your higher self, which is a, a gift, you know. It's a, so it doesn't have to always be a negative thing or the fear is bad because once it transmutes, it's transmuting into something that's super powerful. I think uh, that's what's happening to a lot of people at the moment too. Like, you know, I, I, I sort of feel a bit sad for the people who have been awake for many years because they obviously went through a lot of suffering to start with but everyone seems to be following a process you wake up you get this huge anger at like what the shit is going on right now you know and it, and it builds up a bit of an anger especially if you're an empath as well too and you've got mm -hmm. that inside you and then yeah. you start to see all the same stuff coming around from different people and they're talking about you know things that might happen in the future and you just thought, where are they getting all this information from like is somebody leaking this deliberately and then yeah. you learn that there's like controlled opposition and you're getting um some some stuff's true and some stuff's bullshit but you don't know what's true and what's bullshit anymore because the things that you think are true are people putting it there deliberately as bullshit to confuse you so the best thing to do is to step back and start looking at everything with a bit of a grain of salt and you say oh yeah you know there's a lot of stuff so i'll just put that aside i don't read the vaccine stuff anymore you know and i i'm a definitely a non-vaxxer 
But um, I don't read it anymore because the, the, the fear they're trying to put into everybody is just so much. So everybody has to reach a stage of, I'm going to sort of say like a bliss, where they can look at things with a bit of a different perspective, reach their higher self, do some spiritual stuff, meditation. That's I'm, I'm not really that, I'm, I'm too fast paced a person. My brain's going 100 miles an hour. But, you know, I, I do know how to sort of do that as well. And that's where when you reach that, you have to help the others that are waking up to get there a lot faster. Because when they come in and say, oh, my God, what's going on? You just say, look, it's OK. You just got to get through the process. But, hey, get yourself here quicker if you look at it in this sort of perspective. Mm -hmm. That's just sort of my way of thinking from my journey. And, and I was following some of my friend's footsteps. She got there before me. So the stuff she said to me helped me get there a lot quicker as well, too. So... You know, that's another sort of um, aspect of looking at it. Um, yeah, so um, we've been going an hour and a half, which is really great. Do you have any more questions, Dirk? Yeah, maybe, uh, uh, Tom, if we can speak a bit about health. I know Serena is uh, on, on, on the health topic a lot. I was actually so. sort of going to ask you, because I'm loving what's happening with, you know, Tom at the moment. And Dirk threw me in here to be the, the sort of speaker, so I was sort of a little bit, you know, um, a loss at the beginning and if you start with health right now Tom I can go for hours on that because I love health you know maybe not as much as you but I, I research and research and research a lot is it possible that we could invite you back for another another meeting and we can get into the health aspect of things yeah sure yeah, you know, for sure. I, I, I see you're busy and I see you sort of do so much stuff and you're, you're traveling all over the place talking to people or whatever and I love that and I just I don't want to make it even more busy for you but I would love to be able to do that if that would be awesome yeah I'm, I'm happy to do that for sure yeah is that okay Dirk no I'm not because then he had another topic as well to spirituality also so health can lead into spirituality and that could go for about another one two or three hours because um i can see you're a great talker so um if that's okay um i don't want to you know people can only have an attention span of so long when they're watching yeah. something the subject yeah. is absolutely awesome for me i'm one of the small attention spans six minutes in a video is enough for me and then i start fast forwarding but having listened to you like this now is is just made it so much more I'm like oh my god i'm taking notes and stuff like that but lucky me there's a recording so i can go back over it and slow it down and yeah. take some notes yeah so, no definitely um, the 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 um yeah like the first video that you made with mark was like uh, two two hours and five minutes or something like that and uh, I'm someone that can sit for nine hours and listen to a very good um, deposition. But I know other people find it uh, difficult to listen to something like that. But the snippets that you made, like how to stop tyranny uh, uh, in, in the last week or so, that's really good. And I mean, I, I think people share that uh, around a lot more. So oh, that's I just wanted to say that. Yeah, the, the short ones. I think you brought out uh, uh, four or five short ones. Yeah, about yeah. stopping the, the tyranny and health and law and that it's really the, the crux of the message and that uh, i think uh, made a lot bigger impact in a two-hour uh, interview yeah cool yeah there's um yeah a, a thing that's helpful to pull little snippets out of videos because like you said you know a lot of people don't have the attention span to take in you know everything so they're like an hour an hour and a half so i think usually a good video length for people to to get into otherwise they've got to treat it like a course where they just do half an hour, excuse me, half an hour, pause it and then, yeah, and then learn about it and then come back. And then, you know, it's like, it can be a bit like that. So I do that with my little grandson here in Bali. Anytime anyone sneezes around here now, it's a, oh, Corona comes out, you know. So everyone's just carrying on normal here in, in Bali with that. Um, I'm just going to turn the, the camera off um, shortly and then we'll just have a couple of uh, minutes after that because I don't know if you can see the chat, but Zed is um, saying three three part series would be great. So I just want to thank you, um, Dirk, first of all, for organising this because it was absolutely awesome. Um, and, and Zed and Tom, you know, especially being the main speaker, that was awesome as well too. Um, so just want to say goodbye and I'm going to turn the recording off. Say bye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.